introduction. I am indeed Elizabeth Oswald. Um, I now work for the University of Klagenfurt, but I've spent um, up until most, most recently most of my professional career actually in the UK. I joined the University of Bristol as a um, young lecturer just after doing my PhD in um, Graz at the Technical University. And my, my interest is really that of um, what you could call applied um, kind of security. Applied in the sense that um, whilst uh, my background is in mathematics and I, I really like um, kind of classical cryptography, um, I realized um, sort of early on in my own research that um, if you restrict adversaries, if you restrict the bad guys to just doing a uh, Matsy style attacks, then you're really kind of ignoring what's going on out there in the real world. And in the real world, adversaries, so the bad guys, they get um, often much more data than what theoretical cryptographers or mathematicians um, kind of assume. And um, my interest turned out to be quite a good one, actually, because the field that I started off with called side channel attacks, and we will encounter them here when we think about the security measures in pacemakers. So the side channel attacks, they really, um, in the end, transformed the um, cybersecurity scene. Um, and I will tell you a little bit more about them, perhaps in the kind of course of this talk. So the, the headline here is, can you trust your pacemaker? Um, and a pacemaker is an embedded device in a way. So I was introduced that sort of this is one of my kind of interests. So pacemaker is, is a little device. It's an electronic device that um, we implant in somebody. Um, but it's in a way, it's not so much different to um, perhaps other small embedded devices, things that you might have in your home, maybe your smart speaker, um, your mobile phone for sure, your car key. Um, anything that has um, a little microprocessor in it, and many things these days have a little microprocessor in it that makes them so-called smart devices. Um, so let's have a look at some of the, okay, I'm trying to switch my slide. Yes, there we go. So should you trust your pacemaker? And, and obviously I'm, I'm cho I've chosen this kind of um, topic or this kind of headline. Uh, because actually you shouldn't. Um, so I thought just just for fun and just for general interest, I'll, I'll copy paste some of the sort of headline news that um, appeared over the last uh, I don't know five to six years in the various security outlets. So I, I'm completely aware many of you might have never seen any of these news. Although they are big in security, they're often not so big elsewhere. So one of the big headline news, at least in security, was that in America, um, they actually had to recall pacemakers because of um, various attacks that became public um, by um, academic researchers and by perhaps not quite so academic researchers. Um, one of the perhaps most, profile, most high profile talks was at a conference that we call Black Hat, Black Hat US, so this is actually by white hat hackers. So this is the people who hack products, not for their own immediate gain, but who then go through a responsive disclosure procedure and who kind of inform manufacturers about um, the products that they are selling and that they are actually not very secure. And one such um, kind of talk was given, as I said, in Black Hat um, uh, a while ago. And actually uh, the, the white hat hacker there was a, um, woman who um, is actually a pacemaker user and she's also a cyber security person and she was really worried about the security of the pacemaker that she had been implanted because she couldn't find out much about it so she went she set out to hack her own pacemaker and succeeded um and uh, the other kind of pictures that we have here on this slide that is um a uh, nice looking um a lady up here on the right uh, so she's a phd student in the us um, and there's a large um, funded project where um, the researchers just look at the um, physical security measures that are implemented in, in pacemaker products and um, also the products that talk to pacemakers. Um, pacemakers are not the only um, problem out there when it comes to medical devices. So cardiac defibrillators are equally, um, I think, important and it seems like equally vulnerable. And I'll move on to my next slide. You can also find um, 
research out there out there that um, kind of was concerned with insulin pumps. Again, certainly something that's um, extremely important. Um, and there's more and more um, general research out there that kind of looks at not just also individual devices, but devices in their context. So the systems around the devices as well. Um, and look at the security of these kind of deployed um, systems. So actually only two days ago, I noticed that in the ePrint archive that um, my community likes to kind of utilize, which is called ePrint. The latest paper was called Listen to Your Heart, Evaluation of the Cardiologic Ecosystem. And it doesn't look particularly pretty. But let's have perhaps a little bit more of a technical look at this so-called ecosystem. So you see what I'm talking about. So um, I think often when we think about um, little devices or gadgets, we often don't realize, first of all, how many there are and then how well connected they are. So I want to first address how many there are, just in case you know, you're know you kind of wondering, are we talking about, I don't know, tens of thousands of pacemakers? Are we, what's the kind of, what's the numbers here? So pacemakers, as I said, are one example. There are many other sort of medical things out there. And this is now a new buzzword, seemingly. It's called the Internet of Medical Things, IOMT. Um, and there are some estimates that I found online um, by some more or less reputable sources. And um, Frost and Sullivan, they estimate that in 2015, there were about 4.5 billion so-called IOMTs out there. And um, by now, by 2020, so we're already in 2021, there should be between 20 and 30 billion devices. So these are not small numbers anymore. These are in, uh, incredible numbers of little gadgets out there that do something in relation to healthcare. Now I want to look very briefly at the ecosystem in which many of these devices are in. So, and I want to come back here to the pacemaker example. So uh, the pacemaker is just one bit of a larger system um, that kind of is out there in terms of healthcare. So the patient has this pacemaker implanted. Um, and the pacemaker, I mean, a long time ago, they were indeed just sort of standalone devices. And if you had to reprogram them or do something, this was kind of requiring surgical procedures. That obviously wasn't very desirable. So it feels quite natural in the evolution of pacemakers that you wanted or that people kind of looked into including wireless interfaces to them. Um, and then, of course, there's this kind of element of scope creep that comes in, that you have a wireless interface that perhaps can speak to a particular proprietary um, other device that you would only find in a hospital setting that isn't so easily accessible, that can perhaps not so easily be tampered with. Um, but then, of course, patients might want to monitor themselves. So another wireless interface was added where um, perhaps in a, with a kind of little um, base station that you keep at home, you can kind of read out your own pacemaker signals and see how you're doing. And of course, with the advent of mobile phones, um, having little extra gadgets seems a bit pointless. So many modern pacemakers, they can talk via Bluetooth to your mobile phone or to the owner's mobile phone by uh, talk to an app. And then this app might want to communicate. So interestingly, especially in the US, um, the data that the pacemaker gathers is not necessarily, um, does not necessarily belong to the user, but it actually belongs to the maker of the pacemakers. So um, they might phone home and then transmit all of your vital signs for further analysis by the company. So the pacemaker itself is clearly a very, very important element, but it can talk to a lot of other entities and if you just think about it now from a security perspective, even if you're not a security expert, then the more the more parties um, a thing can communicate with, the more interfaces there are, the more attack points you have. And so um, these systems are actually quite complex. And um, sadly, um, many of these interfaces that are, that are defined here, they are so-called proprietary systems and proprietary interfaces, which means that a company defines that in secret. There is no public security analysis. Um, and um, different companies have different sort of interfaces. So products are not necessarily even, um, they can't even um, communicate with each other. So this is not a great state of affairs. Um, and I've taken this picture here out of the paper that I quoted earlier on, which is the most recent one out there 
if you want to kind of look a little bit more into how the system here really works. But um, I want to kind of keep on and maybe drill a bit down into just some specific aspects here in terms of security. So, as I said, there are many interfaces and the problem, every, every additional interface is another attack point. Um, and every additional element in a system is a potential attack point. So maybe even if your pacemaker is fairly under your control, because obviously you, are, you have it inside of you and you um, kind of probably protect it from um, malicious influences as much as you can. But even if you do that, then because it can talk to other parties, the other parties could be compromised. And uh, the problem is that they can also send commands to the pacemaker. So um, one scenario that um, has been sort of thought about was, well, what happens if um, during um, a software update of the pacemaker, actually, because the other party that produces the update is not necessarily authenticated, that you get um, a, an update that uh, sort of encrypts perhaps things on your pacemaker. Very similar to so-called ransomware attacks, which maybe you have heard about. In that, in that way, you could then basically, well, hold pacemaker holders um, to ransom and say, well, only if you pay me X many Bitcoin, um, I will release your pacemaker and um, you, can, you can keep living. Um, it could also be that the remote partner, partner, one of the remote stations, actually leaks transmitted data. And um, it's quite, I think it's quite obvious that the data currently is being collected by pacemaker makers because this is valuable. <laughs> Um, so leaking them to third parties is certainly something we, we don't really want to happen. Um, and, and many of these issues kind of creep up really because the, the way in which the products have been built and, and the way in which the systems have been built is by a concept that we call security by obscurity. It's a concept that we find often in real life in sort of communities that haven't yet really embraced um, cybersecurity as something that is um, really, really important and needs to be taken seriously. And the idea here is that, well, you kind of believe that complexity gives security. So if I don't explain to you how my communication protocol works, then it's hard for you to break it, which is nonsense. And I will show you in a moment why. So this brings us slightly closer to side channel attacks. So in, in systems that we deploy, um, we typically have some form of security model. And in the security model, we kind of assume that there are cert certain bits of information an adversary gets access to and others they don't. But what if that security model isn't quite true, isn't quite accurate for real life? And it has turned out over the last 20 years that the security models that we used weren't indeed quite accurate. In practice, especially when it comes to embedded devices or things that are standing somewhere around that you have easy access to, or maybe that even you own, if you can measure um, side channels. So this would be something like the power consumption, the electromagnetic emanation that the device emits, the time it takes to do something, if it has got LEDs, LEDs um, whether there's a correlation between how they blink and the internals, sound of a device. Um, you can name all sorts of things. All of these little bits of extra information, they often tend to be somehow related to the internal workings of a device. And it turns out that if you have access to this additional information, you can A, reverse engineer things very, very efficiently, and B, you can often even without knowing all of the inner workings, you can extract secret data that is inside the device. And these kind of attacks that use additional information, they have been successfully deployed against a range of real world systems. So they are a very, very real and serious threat. How do they work? Very briefly. Um, so this is also now what brings us here actually to, to data science. So the way in which they work, and this is now a super high level sort of explanation that glances over many, many interesting details, is that somewhere you have a device that you're trying to attack in the sense that there is some data that goes in and out that you can observe, but there's also some data inside which the device is meant to keep secret and you want to get this data. So you can watch the device, you can see what's going in, you can see what's, go what's coming out in terms of data. Um, maybe there's encrypted data, so you, you, you see it, but maybe it makes no sense. And then you can measure some extra information. This is what I call here real behavior on, on the slide. And then somehow, 
um, before you go and, and do the attack, you have created some form of model of the device. This could be a super trivial model, which is simply a computer program where you say, well, if um, this bit of data goes in and I make an assumption about um, that the first bit of the secret data in the device being zero, then I will see low power consumption and otherwise I see high power consumption. So it could be as trivial as that, or it could be super sophisticated. And this is where data science comes in. If we have a copy of the device that we want to attack, we can create really sophisticated profiles of that device using either the classical statistical modeling techniques or often these days we also use a range of techniques from machine learning and deep learning so it's very popular in my community now to train all sorts of deep nets e that kind of yeah represents the e Elizabeth, idea. sorry to interrupt uh, there is a, there are only a few minutes left so please yeah, and see. i'm on the um, second but last slide perfect thanks a lot <laughs> so as I said, this is where kind of data science comes in. Um, maybe uh, a, a nugget more of information. So the modeling part, um, so here in, in, in our community, we are kind of interested both in explanatory and predictive models. Um, so again, we draw, we draw a range on a range of kind of uh, techniques. And when it comes to the actual analysis part and side channel, Information normally comes in, in the form of traces. So this is highly multivariate data and we don't really understand often how data points are related to each other. And then we also try and evaluate devices that come onto the market. So we try and find measures for information leakage. Um, so yeah, we kind of draw on a range of um, what you might call data science techniques for that. Now, um, this kind of brings me to the end, really, of this kind of little taster that I'm giving you here for cybersecurity problems that you can look at with data science. Um, maybe the most important conclusion is you shouldn't really trust any, any small device that you have, because most of them have not been thoroughly evaluated. Security by obscurity never works long enough so that it leads to secure products in practice. Um, these kind of physical observations that we can get in practice, they are extremely powerful. So the a little bit of additional information goes a long way. And um, research in the area that I'm in just builds on a natural link between data science techniques um, and sort of applications in cybersecurity. This is the end. Um, thank you very much. I hope this was reasonably entertaining. Um, and if there's time, I, I can answer some questions. Thanks a lot, Elizabeth, for taking your time and showing us all this important and interesting stuff, even in hybrid mode. Are there any questions? Of course, we have some time. Maybe online this time. No questions online. Come on, where is our online audience? In the room. Yeah, there is one question up here. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, you're talking about a lot about research. How much of this is already into the implementation phase, or how much of this is currently being yeah. So, um, in terms of uh, so products that take this into account and that implement some countermeasures. So, when we look at um, highly regulated um, kind of areas like um, the banking industry. So there, they take this extremely seriously. And um, so things like credit and debit cards, they are very, very well protected. Um, the earliest adopter of countermeasures was interestingly the pay TV industry, because these kind of physical attacks, they were extremely um, easy to apply, not just to the um, little smart cards that you early on used in pay TV systems, but also to the set-top boxes. So also there, these things are quite well protected these days. Um, and then also some other little gadgets, um, printer cartridges, for instance. Um, they are also a very valuable little thing that you have to buy, right? The printer is cheap. The cartridges are eye-wateringly eye expensive. And also there are a lot of companies deploy that. Um, there is more going on in terms of um, trying to find ways of standardized security evaluations in the IoT context, but I think we are perhaps still a bit far away from, from this being normality for 
I don't know, the off-the-shelf speaker that you put somewhere, the smart speaker or anything else that's a smart device. Thanks a lot. Again, this is your applause again for uh, another question. Uh, oh no, we have an online question of course and we also take it. We are a bit over time but we will spend some more minutes. Try to make it short. Uh, Vulti says, great presentation, thanks a lot. And asks about uh, the help of a blockchain system with the security, whether you have investigated something in this direction. <laughs> um, so, so no, I've never looked um, at blockchains. I know that some of the um, wallets um, that kind of hold blockchain, some of the um, hardware things, they were broken with side channel stuff. So <laughs> um, <laughs> that I, I know, but I have never actually looked at this myself. Um, so yeah, the crypto tokens, they were broken with side channels. Okay, with this, we conclude our last talk and also the Q&A session. Thanks a lot again for joining. This is your applause. And thank you very much.